Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. That kid is back on the escalator again. And don't hurt. Is my boomstick. Game over, man. Game over. Welcome to the Bargain Bin. He is your host, Ben Mason. And he is your co-host, Sandra Luketic. And today we're talking 1993's The Sandlot. We assume if you're listening to this episode, you have already seen the movie, which I had not up until last night. You remember last week? Uh, vaguely. <laughs> you remember last week when you said Craig doesn't get any more picks? Yeah, you're in charge of that, not me, man. No, I'm not. The people are in charge of that. I have no sway on how these things get done. So the people are the ones to blame. Yeah, this is not a good movie for review. I'm not saying it's a good movie or a bad movie. I'll leave that till the end. This is not a movie made to be put under the microscope even remotely. I will agree with that. Um, I had never seen this movie before, as previously stated. Um, and when it was put up to the vote, I was very angry. Um, <laughs> you called people out a few weeks ago. You said, <laughs> do your worst. <laughs> That's fine. I get it. And I, I made notes for it. I I've got 13 pages of notes here. I, 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 I did what I said I would do. Now I agree with you. This is not a film to be reviewed. It is a movie to be seen as a child. And that, that was my big problem with this going in is I do not have the nostalgia factor that everybody else who has seen this movie has. So I would have been 11 when this came out, probably the best age to see the film going into it. Now I was very angry. I was annoyed and I knew I was going to hate it. But when did you first see this? Same answer as the last few weeks. My dad would have rented it when it was relatively new. Okay. So basically early 90s, you were yeah. the right age. Okay. Um, I, I want to make one statement, though, in just in regards to putting movies under the microscope. I think it's going to be a seldom occurrence that a movie intended for children will be good for review. Yeah. I mean, there are a few out there. If it's intended for children and it is absolutely a train wreck, I got something to work with. But just in general, yeah, like kids movies are meant to be viewed by kids, not critical eyes. Okay, yes, I, I do agree with that. Uh, there is something about this particular film, though, um, which caught me off guard. And that is the voiceover by the adult Scott Smalls. And, and that is, he's probably early 40s at this point. And he's talking about the that one summer as an adult. Um, I don't think kids would really pick up on it, but there is a weird sense of reminiscence that comes through that voiceover. And he, like I said, he's probably early 40s. And that, that's what hooked me right away. I'm like, okay, so they are putting elements in this film that older viewers can identify with or at least calm their nerves a bit and realize they're not just watching a stupid kids movie. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe that's the impression they gave you, but this is a kid's movie. Don't it let is. that narrative fool you at all. No, there are certain elements of this though, that specifically at the very end that no kid is going to understand, but it makes adults question what happened. Cool. Um, what are your what are your memories of it though as a kid? You say you probably saw it when your dad rented it when it was relatively new. Do you remember yeah. liking it? Yeah, I thought it was fine. Wasn't like one of the ones where like for example, nostalgia, you know, I, I go back and rewatch movies that I loved as a kid that were intended for kids like the Mighty Ducks, for example, sticking even to sports movies. Mm -hmm. But this one I never really felt the need to go back and rewatch. I didn't think like, there was no part of me that was like, oh, man, I remember that movie being bad. No, it was fine, but it wasn't great. It wasn't anything that I was like, I need to watch that again. So more or less rather forgettable. Yeah, it, was, it just was. All right. I remember all of my friends talking about it, and I just never bothered seeing it. So it was it was very popular here. Um, don't really 
get why, but uh, uh, baseball's big uh, out on the East Coast. Uh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure is. Um, th- I do have to say, though, this movie really reminded me of the Wonder Years. Did you ever watch that show growing up? Not really. No, just like a show set. I think the Wonder Wonder Years was set in the fifties. This is sixty two, I believe. Um, again, voiceover narrator. Um, in the in the show, it was Daniel Stern, and the kid was played by. Uh, oh my God, why Savage. am I forgetting? Fred Savage? Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I get that it's kind of cool. I I do like period pieces, especially when it's set like relatively recently, fifties, sixties, seventies. Um, but let's, um, let's just hop into the movie. Yeah. No. Oh, right. We have to play a game where I fuck up every time. Oh, don't worry. There isn't much on this one. Is there's only one, right? Uh, yes. I will say yes. Okay. Because the other one is kind of like last week's such and such number two played such and such number nothing in the other movie. Oh, that was a nightmare. Yeah. So there's only actually one in this. And that that person, who is in films we've covered before, yet again, is Art Lafleur. Man, that was just recent. I know, right? So you I, can't get it wrong. What was he in? Uh, Trancers as McNulty, and I already forget the other one. Come on, man! It was in the other one that you got McNulty. <laughs> Oh, God. I don't... Um, Come on. You can do it, buddy. Oh, yeah. In the Army Now. There you go. It was... <laughs> I didn't did need it. any help or anything. <laughs> I got it, dude. All right. And then one last thing before we get into the episode. I just want to remind everyone we do have merch now available through Redbubble. You can get it. Uh, if you need the link, you can head to bsbargainbin.com. Click on the merch tab. And I'm not 100%, but I believe they are doing another five-day sale leading up to Christmas where all website product is 25% off. Nice. So check it out if you want. Yeah. Baseball. Yeah, you can get into the movie now. Well, the film opens on a man walking through the hallways of a sports arena, eventually entering a press box overlooking a baseball field. And this man, Scott Smalls, recounts the great moment in baseball history when during a game, Babe Ruth pointed out where his next hit was going and nailed a 400-foot home run with bases loaded. Yeah, except for the fact that he says that it's like the one most great moment in sports history. No, man. No. 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 Uh, The voiceover that we're getting, though, is by writer-director David Mickey Evans. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and it, it's really cool. Like, he was so invested in his project. He he was so passionate about it when he was writing it. Obviously, pretty great director. And his line delivery is fantastic. But this voiceover leads us back to Small's best summer of his life in 1962 when he met Benny Rodriguez, who helped him out of the, quote, biggest pickle he'd ever been in. And I hate that term, and they just use it repeatedly in this movie. So many times! He says it within, like, the next ten minutes. It's like, yeah, we got it, man. We got it. One dilly of a pickle. Um, We see a kid's baseball game play out. Uh, Benny, mentioned before, played by uh, Mike Vitar, who you would probably know from Mighty Ducks 2 and 3. Yeah, you would too. I mean, you co-starred with him. I sure did. Yeah. We'll never forget that guy. Super sweetheart. Yeah. Uh, well, you got one of your other co-workers in this, too. I know. I know. I was very happy about this, man. <laughs> uh, although none of them told me they were in this movie. No, We didn't even talk about it on set. Yeah, it's weird. But uh, Benny, caught between uh, two basemen, uh, eventually makes it to home plate. Uh, Smalls had just moved to town. Um can you describe Scott Smalls to me? He's a small kid. <laughs> Very intelligent, nerdy, dressed like a nerd, too. Um, I have to say, I didn't recognize Smalls. Were you supposed to? Well, the thing is, when I saw the name Tom Guiri, 
I've met Tom. What? Yeah. Oddly enough, here in Halifax. See, I told you I baseball is huge on the East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't I didn't recognize him as like a kid, obviously. I met him what like years and years later. He was here filming um Scotland PA. It's kind of like Macbeth told in the fast food industry. Also keeping in mind that you hadn't seen this movie before you met him. No, he was just a dude who I knew was like filming a movie with Christopher Walken here. There you go. So I think we can excuse that you <laughs> didn't know that that was him. Um, we meet his stepfather, Bill, played by Dennis Leary, who seems to not really care about his stepson whatsoever and is yeah. constantly making empty promises like teaching Smalls how to play catch. Well, I mean... One look at how he did, and I wouldn't want to teach him either. I wouldn't have the patience for that. But what yeah. a missed opportunity to actually put in a plot with him earning his stepdad's admiration through baseball. Agreed. Because it, there is a bit of a weird payoff at the end, but it feels hollow. It's just tacked on to the end yeah. of the plot. Yeah, and it also makes me like Bill even less. I do like seeing Dennis Leary on screen. I know nothing of his like real life character traits, like if he's actually a nice guy or not, but he kind of comes across as an asshole in everything he does. I mean, he wrote a song about it. That's true. Uh, we see that he's a major sports fan, has like a trophy room and has a prized autographed Babe Ruth baseball. Uh, he's a major baseball fan. That hardly counts. You hate baseball, don't you? Oh, I hate it. Bring it on, baseball fans. It's not a sport. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think baseball is more of a sport than basketball. Yeah, well, nope. Yeah, okay. Smalls follows a gang of friends to the sand. Well, the, the gang is friends. He's not friends with them yet. Uh, to the I'm sand so lot. glad the narrator clarified that because I was like, how did he know where it was? Yeah. And then the narrator's like, oh, one day after school, I just followed them there. Like, yeah. That's not creepy. <laughs> where he watches them play baseball. From um, the bushes. <laughs> from the bushes. <laughs> uh, he does say one thing, though, that I really like, and that is that um, the kids never keep score, they never play sides, and they just keep playing all day, only, only to continue the following day. Um, definitely showing, like, the passion for the, and I'm going to say this, and you have to agree, sport. Activity, sure, yeah. Sport, yep. Yeah, it's a great pastime. Then we get the disturbance at the fence. And I hated this. <laughs> I fucking hated this. Like, it's shaking, and you hear growling, and there's dust clouds coming up from underneath it. And this is where the movie really starts to feel like a straight-up kids' film for me. So, question. Uh-huh. Is Hercules these physical attributes and the monstrosity of it just in their imaginations? It has to be. It like, wouldn't make sense otherwise, but they're all like, is this a mass hallucination then? Well, we have to keep in mind that the entire movie is the recollection of one person. It's the narrator. Yeah. So. Uh, unreliable narrator too. That's good. good point. So we can assume that perhaps all of this is just like, the exaggeration of a child's memory. But even he has to realize as an adult that that would not be possible. I mean, he's telling the story as he remembers it. Fine. I don't know. I'm just trying to think of something. It's bad. <laughs> uh, Benny hits the ball, which cracks Smalls right in the face, knocking him over. Doesn't crack him in the face. He falls over trying to catch it. I thought it did hit him in the face though, when he was backing up. No. Okay, it's, you can be wrong. That's fine. Uh, he goes right, to get the ball I mean, he... and does so after another quick scare from the fence. But he doesn't know how to throw the ball. How do you not know how to throw a ball? I don't know, man. Like, they say he just finished fifth grade. You've never even, like, look at a baseball game on TV and emulate what you see. You don't Swing even... your arm and let go. It's not that difficult. You don't need to know how to throw a ball. You have, by, okay, at that age, you have thrown something. Anything. But oh, he's, That's what they're hinting at when he's in he's, his room with his mechanical toys in the, in the next scenes coming up. 
and that like that machine throws a ball and hits his mom in the face. He's just had machines do it for him all his life. I love his mom. This kid's from the future. No, it's not from the future. <laughs> okay. Anyway, the embarrassed Smalls runs away. Yeah, but as yeah. he should. Let's throw a ball. That night, Smalls has a heart-to-heart with his mother, played by Karen Allen. I don't know if you recognize her from anything. No, sir. Uh, Marion from uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Never seen it. What the fuck? You, you've never seen <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yeah, I've seen it. I was just playing up the joke of that. I've never seen anything. I was dumbfounded for a second. <laughs> Every Everybody's seen that movie. Anyway, she urges him to get outside and make some friends. And she, she really just wants him to have the life of a regular child. And I think she just wants him out of the house so she can have some time alone with her newly wed husband of the last year. No, I think you're wrong there and your head's going in the wrong direction. Oh, for sure it is. But I will tell you, during this scene, I had so many questions. Because the intro questions? narration, when they're moving into the neighborhood, Smalls literally says... We moved in a couple weeks before school gave out for the summer. Not enough time to make friends. We're supposed to believe that that would have been a possibility for him when his mom comes in the room and just says, I don't want you to spend your whole summer in your room like you did last year and the year before. Well, clearly being somewhere situated for a period of time didn't help him make friends there. You are definitely looking into this way too much. Well, I mean, I was actually watching the movie. What were you doing? Watching the movie. <laughs> And, and it's a kid's <laughs> film. You just, I think you honestly try and like, you, you observe characters within films just to find flaws in them to make fun of them and insult them. Well, I need something to talk about. No, there, no, there, that, that's, you have an issue, man. <laughs> You're, you are making fun of a child's inability to make friends because of a lack of self confidence. No, I'm talking about the movie scripting. You don't have to say you didn't have friends the last couple years. You could play up the whole thing. You're putting in two conflicting narratives. One, you didn't no, have no, friends because no. you didn't move in long, like quick enough. You, and then a, you were not calling out the script until I called you out. Well, I mean, I thought you that's were making exactly fun what of I was little saying. Little Scotty Smalls. Oh yeah, he's a wiener, but L7. Beyond him being a wiener. The scripting is not consistent. What's the reason he doesn't have any friends? I mean, is it because he came to school too late? Is it because he's a wiener? Is it because he stays inside with his robots? Just give us one reason for it. Uh, I'll give you a reason for it. Cool. The writer, director, and voice of adult Scott Smalls heavily based this on his life, and he probably doesn't understand why he didn't have friends. At some point, it should have. There you go. He's looking back at. There it. you go. Pick on that writing there. Pick on that man's life experiences. You're a fucking bully, man. <sighs> okay, we're talking about a fictional character in a movie, but okay. <laughs> Mrs. Smalls, who is not given a first name, forces Bill to teach Smalls how to play catch, and it definitely does not go well. And boy, does she force him! <laughs> and I love how. After he says multiple times, like, no, it's okay, you're busy. No, it's fine, it's okay. And she's just like, come on, you can't spare 30 minutes? She turns <laughs> to him and she's like, I told you so. It's like, well, yeah, because you forced it. <laughs> One of the cringiest moments of this movie, for me, I think you might agree, is instead of throwing the ball back to Bill, Smalls just runs it over to him. And then puts it in the glove like he's punching it. Yeah. I found that really weird. I did too. I, I felt really bad for this character. Like he you know is, what he could have done is rolled it. That way he maintains the distance, but he's not throwing. Yeah, that doesn't work for him later, though. <laughs> I mean, not much <laughs> works for him. This kid's a weenie. Oh, well, it's, yeah, he ends up with a black eye, too. <laughs> well, he deserved it. Yeah, at least he caught it. Uh, but, uh, kind sure. of. Sure. He blocked his face and the ball went in the mitt. But uh, the solution for the black guy, I hadn't seen in a long time. And that's just put a cold steak on it for an hour. Yeah. You hadn't seen it for a long time, but it was definitely something we saw in movies quite a bit in the 90s. 
oh, cartoons too. Oh, for sure. Um, Benny sees a pouting Smalls and invites him to join the guys playing baseball. Smalls uses his broken glove as an excuse not to, but Benny lets him use his spare glove. Great scene. I loved it. That was nice of Benny. Not yeah. sure why he took pity on the kid, but he did. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was expecting in this, is that Benny would be somewhat of the, like, a not a bully like you, but, like, a, kind of a standoffish, not sure if he's, like, a great guy or just an okay guy. But from the very beginning, he's a sweetheart. Yeah, he's a nice guy. Yeah, he's just a really nice guy. I, I found that very refreshing because there really aren't any bullying characters in this film. And in a sports movie, mm. quite rare. Mm. In a pastime movie, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, we meet the rest of the gang. Uh, Timmy and Tommy Timmons, Squints, Yeah Yeah, Bertram, Kenny, and Ham, played by Patrick Renna. Do you recognize him? The Big Green. Yes. And I've mentioned this to you before. Son-in-law. There you go. But I, I don't remember Son-in-law. It's been, it's been a long time. Yo, no, that's fine. I, I wouldn't worry too much. I'll make you watch it soon. Um, none of them at all are stoked about Smalls joining them. Uh, and Benny being the cool kid and leader, I guess, shuts them all down out of kindness to Smalls. I love how some of the like nerdy kids with their glasses and their baseball gloves are like, he can't play with us. He's a nerd. <laughs> uh, look in the mirror, dude. Yeah. Old squints. I like squints, though. I honestly, <laughs> I like I like most of these characters. Sure. You don't? I'm a bunch of baseball playing nerds. I didn't realize you hated baseball this much. <laughs> I, I, I think you should be more angry at Craig than I am. <laughs> I'm just goofing around. I mean, I would have much rather watched something like Major League, but whatever. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, we should totally do Major League soon. That'd be great. Uh, nothing, well, nothing offensive in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> just stand up human beings playing it great all, characters. It all, <laughs> it all passes by today's standards. <laughs> oh, for sure. Uh, Smalls embarrasses himself again uh, when playing baseball, missing the ball and falling over. This is what we were saying before. Picking it up and running it back to Kenny. Uh, the dumbfounded look on Kenny's face is priceless. And I, I wish we saw more of Kenny de Nunez. Because he seems I... to be the less developed of all of the characters. But he seems pretty cool. I mean, he... he... Just finished recording Mighty Ducks. He's got to get prepared for Mighty Ducks 2, I assume, the next year. So he's, he's a busy guy. Good point. I remember those times well. Uh, Smalls tries to leave in shame, but Benny won't let him quit because he's a stand-up guy. And tells him that baseball is all about fun, having fun. Stop thinking so much and just have fun. Yeah, I disagree with a statement here. Oh, yeah. Me too. <laughs> he says... You would have caught that if you were having fun. I don't, I don't know, man. That's, yeah. that's not how it works. But he catches the next ball and throws it and now is immediately accepted into the gang. Uh, the <laughs> This guy must have done some drinking before he started doing narration of his memories. <laughs> it's, it's a kid's movie. I'm, I'm totally going to let that pass here. But it is ridiculous. Uh, then we get another absolutely annoying tease about what's behind the fence. It's a, it's a dog, all right? It's yeah, a we dog. Know. We know, guys. You guys haven't seen a dog before? Not the beast. As everyone heads home, Benny tells Smalls to keep the glove, also to wear a t-shirt and jeans next time, and gives Smalls his old hat to wear. Yo, okay, you're a nice guy and all. Giving him the glove, that's amazing, but... Yeah. You're telling him to wear jeans. He's wearing shorts. I get the t-shirt part, but like in like two days, you guys are going to be too hot to play baseball. Are you telling yeah. him to wear jeans? I'm thinking it's more so for sliding into bases. You don't want to be wearing shorts for that. Yeah, it looks like he does a lot of sliding into bases there. Also, who carries a spare hat with them? Uh, Benny. Obviously. Apparently. Um. This scene did make me smile, though, because that is a really nice offering from Benny. But seeing Smalls 
so excited to run into the house to tell his mom about his day what is so dweeb. heartwarming. Oh, what shut a up. loser. What are you talking about? He's got to tell his only Why other friend that he made some this new movie? friends. Oh, my God. <laughs> the tables have turned. <laughs> um, I do have to say, like, I loved seeing this. And I, although I think I'm, I might just be jaded, but this is a level of wholesomeness that I, I can't comprehend as being realistic whatsoever. It's a movie for kids, man. Get over it. Me? <laughs> Me get over it. Okay. Fine. The next day, Ham hits the ball over the fence into the terrain of the beast and the kids are pissed. Problem with this. Mm-hmm. Smalls is the one who decides to climb the fence and get the ball, but is confused when everyone screams at him to stop. He was terrified of this fence yesterday. Not to mention, <laughs> what? All, the kids, all the kids are like, oh, if you thought, you wouldn't have thought to do that. It's like, maybe if you had given him a proper warning beforehand, he would have thought to not do that. <laughs> Like, you guys just told him, don't. And then we're surprised when he didn't know why he shouldn't. Yeah. Kids are a um, bunch of jerks. Yeah, they, they, again, kids. I get it. We get our first view of part of the beast, the giant paws. I hate it. I hate it so much. Don't show it. Just don't. They show way too much of this puppet dog. And it doesn't look good ever. I, I just, it confuses me. You you do a much better job by not showing anything and just using the sound effects. The sound effects are great. Dust clouds, I kind of hate, but they're better than the stupid puppet. I agree. That night, the gang meets up at the treehouse. And what a fucking amazing treehouse, man. I was super jealous. It rivals the one from the Monster Squad. I also find it interesting that it's on the sandlot. Yeah, because I don't feel like we saw it up until this point no especially considering like over it the hangs, fence. yeah it hangs over the fence to the n- neighbor where the dog is but like d- does somebody own the sand lot here <laughs> who's to say they don't go and there's like other kids in there they're like yo get lost that's a good question i never thought about that it's like you can't just claim ownership to a, a tree house in a public park <laughs> Although I, I I get the feeling from watching other movies set in the '60s that like times were different, neighborhoods were kind of owned by the kids, and most kids in the neighborhood would be friends and hang out in the same spot. And we kind of get that rivalry too later on with the uh, little league team. It's like they're from the other side of town or something. So really, what I'm saying is that this part of town only has nine kids. <laughs> that seems like it because before Small showed up, they only had eight. Yep. Although I would argue that that's maybe not the truth because when they go to the swimming pool, there's a bunch of extras that are kids. Yeah, that's weird, right? I didn't think about that. So anyway, maybe they just, you know, don't like baseball. These are the nine kids in the neighborhood that like baseball. Maybe you're right. Maybe baseball isn't a sport. (laughs) It's a sport. Uh, Ham teaches Smalls the wonders of s'mores. I I didn't make any more notes about this because it's, cringy but you can go into it if you want to well i mean ham teaches them what a s'more is. like what do you want me to say about that well it's just like the back and forth it's like do you want s'mores like well i didn't have any in the first place how can i have more <sighs> <laughs> see like i i thought you would pick up on that that's why i well, left is, it blank is small supposed to be a smart nerdy kid or not because i don't know i have even no idea if you think he'd know what a s'more is well you, at least you think if he was confused, he would ask a more relevant question. Yeah. Like, what's a s'more? Exactly. Squint he's relays the, the origin stupidest story smart the kid around. He's, yeah, he's, he's weird, man. Because they really do play him up as an intelligent kid who just asks stupid questions. Uh, okay, how about this? How about we just say he's naive? He's eager Perfect. to make friends and he's a little naive. Yeah, we'll go with that. Socially awkward. See, we can be nice. Yeah. That's not going to last long, is it? No, 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 no not even a little okay. bit. Squints relays the origin story of the beast. 
And I ask you, Sandro, what is that legend? Uh, so the, the owner got a dog <laughs> who I guess we're to believe was a normal dog. <laughs> but then he fed him full <laughs> size of beef. Which <laughs> so fucking dumb. Which somehow turned him into a beast because he wanted to repay the kindness of being fed full sides of beef. And then I guess the beef gave him a taste for blood, so he just ate everyone. I have here Squint says he killed between 120 to 173 thieves. And then the police tell them that he has to be locked up in the backyard forever. Not, no, they, they don't just tell him to lock him up in the backyard. They tell Mr. Myrtle, the beast's owner, to chain him up under the house. Yes. Odd casting, <laughs> odd, odd casting for Mr. Myrtle, though. Which, I, 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 is this supposed to be the same Mr. Myrtle as later? Yeah. They didn't do a very good job finding a lookalike. Well, here he's white, and later he is not. No. Much better casting job later on, though. Oh, yeah, but Absolutely it's amazing. all very, very confusing. Yeah, and it just goes to show how the kids have no idea what they're talking about. They don't no. even know what Mr. Myrtle looks like. No, none whatsoever. I will point out that this is where the other partial person in the movie came in partial person yeah because uh thief number two. <laughs> oh no don't fine okay. okay yeah go for it what was thief number two in that we covered i don't remember why no you you don't bring that up and then not <laughs> tell me i forgot are you serious yeah i had it written down and i don't know where i put it why would you bring it up then well, because it's a very important role was thief number two. Okay, that tracks. <laughs> the next day. I mean, you should recognize him from the other movie he was in anyway. Well, then you must have it memorized. No, I have no idea. I can't remember what it was. Yeah, exactly. The next day, Squints is awestruck when he sees teenager Wendy Peppercorn. And this makes them late for baseball. Um... Did you recognize Wendy? No, I did not. Marley Shelton, who played Deputy Judy Hicks in Scream 4 and 5. Yeah, I wasn't going to remember that. Uh, oh, Thief number two played Punk number two in Suburban Commando. Who was Punk number two? Uh, I don't know. When, when did that happen in the movie? I don't know. Okay. It doesn't tell me that on IMDb. It just has what he played. Okay, well, you were talking like I should know who it was, and you can't even tell me where in the movie this person popped up. Obviously, I was being sarcastic, Ben. I know. I think you're the bully. Getting there. <clears throat> uh, fun line from uh, Yeah Yeah when they get to the Sandlot explaining why they're late, and that's Squints was perving a dish. Well, Squints is a perv. Yes, he is. And we really see that in the next scene. Yep. Because like you had mentioned, that day it is too hot to play ball. So the gang votes to go to the community pool. And while there, Squints fakes drowning. So lifeguard Wendy Peppercorn will perform CPR on him. During this, he makes his move and kisses her. And she is rightly pissed off. She is a bad lifeguard. She's terrible. Is is he holding his breath that whole time? Because if she was a good lifeguard, she'd see he's breathing. He doesn't need mouth to mouth. Well, she could also hear the heartbeat. And the other thing is, what if this plan went wrong? Can you imagine the sandlot ends with squints drowning? <laughs> they just place like a tombstone on his <laughs> spot of the sandlot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> None of us ever went back to the sandlot. We assume the beast is still there ruling his yard. I never talked to the guys again, but I wish them all the best. Sad music roll credits. And then like this, after he gets thrown out for just being a complete pervert. Well, they're all banned for life. 
or which so I don't understand why they are. It, right? Again, like, unreliable narrator. They didn't know he was doing that. They tried to stop him and were genuinely concerned when they thought he was dead. Definitely gives me one of my favorite lines from the movie, though, from uh, Timmy. And I did not expect this in this movie <laughs> where Timmy just goes, oh, man, he's in deep shit. Did not expect swearing in the Sandlot. Okay. Especially from Timmy. What, you didn't like that line? Not really. I got I mean, a really good laugh. I didn't it. dislike it, but it just it was just a line that kind of happened. Well, as are all lines in movies. The thing but I didn't like is how they suggested that after that, every time he walked by, she smiled at him. Like, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is kind of weird. Uh, I, one thing that really did stand out to me, too, in this scene uh, was hearing the song This Magic Moment by the Drifters. I love the Drifters. It made me realize how good this soundtrack really is. And I couldn't comprehend the amount of money that they would have had to spend correctly to get the music rights. How long does it take for these things to become public domain? Music? Yeah. Almost never. Okay. Yeah. Independence Day night game. The kids play by the light of the fireworks. That's Can't get real. more American than that. Yeah. Again, going to the music, though, I always love this rendition of America the Beautiful by Ray Charles. Um, but it seems like the narrator is trying to remove himself as the lead and kind of push Benny forward. Benny is the lead. Is Benny the main character of the Sandlot? Yes. He's he's the leader of the gang. You think he's the, the main character, eh? Yes. Why? It all revolves around him. The, the, this Smalls is literally telling a story of admiration about Benny. Yes, but Smalls is in every fucking scene, except for one. That's just to throw you off. No, that makes it's him a the narrative main character. Device. The focus can be on Benny, but Smalls is the main character. Well, of course the focus is going to be on Benny. Smalls is a nerd that nobody likes. And you see, for us, baseball was a game. But for Benjamin Franklin Rodriguez, baseball was life. I love how Benny shows up last minute and tells him, come on, it's a night game. So like, did you not know that the 4th of July was coming up? You couldn't have told him the day before? <laughs> hey, man, we play a night game tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, spontaneity. Kids don't plan shit, man. Kids are stupid. Yeah, we all were. Some of us still are. Some of us will always be. Um, the next day at the Sandlot, we see a similar scene of Benny being caught between two bases. Um, here's where they're confronted by that little league team I was talking about, the Tigers. And uh, when Ham insults one of them by saying they play ball like a girl, they set a game for the next day. Oh, it's on. And again, music, man. Green Onions by Booker T and the MGs. Uh, one of my favorite songs of all time. And I lucked out and... Uh, actually got uh, my CD autographed by uh, Booker T. And that is definitely sitting on top of a bookshelf here. Um, the next day's game, the gang trounces the Tigers with great ease. Um, fun scene. What's the point? It's such a flat moment. I watch all these sports movies and you watch a team get trounced and then work to improve and overcome the odds. They say right from the start, Small says they're great at this. And then they trounce the team and you're like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Like I, I can't think of another film where the underdogs right off the bat, kick the shit out of the other team. And they're like, well, moving on. Yeah. This movie is about 30 minutes too long. Oh yeah. It, An it's, hour a, 40 it's a runtime. long movie. It it doesn't need to be, though. It feels so much longer than it actually is, too. Yeah, it really does. Um, editing. Fucking... <laughs> the editors missed the ball on this one. Like they, it, uh, No pun intended there. But good god damn. Fix this. Mm -hmm. That night, they go to the carnival to celebrate. Benny buys tickets for everyone, and Bertram gives the gang Big Chief chewing tobacco, just like their heroes use. 
Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, it's so dumb. It's so dumb. This whole scene is... This is another scene that just doesn't need to be in the movie. No. They go on multiple rides and eventually all get sick and throw up because of the tobacco. Does nothing for the plot. Just like the previous scene. And the next morning, Small's mom takes Bill to the airport as he has to spend a week in Chicago for work. And Bill promises to play more catch upon his return. I mean, did sure, they Bill. play any more at any other time? Because no. this isn't the next day. How long has it been since they played that first game of catch? I mean, well, like I said, sm- Bill makes empty promises. Small's eye is healed. How long That's has it been? That's a good point. That's a very good point. <laughs> Again, like, why not just, if you're going to make the movie this incredibly long, pepper in some scenes where... Bill sees him progressing as a baseball player and they start to bond and maybe Bill even invites him to watch a game on TV with him one night. Like, make something out of it. Otherwise, it's just happening for no reason. Yeah, there's a lot of pointless shit in this movie. Um, But Smalls gets us back on track because he reminds us again that this is when the gang gets into the biggest pickle of all time. Jesus, you took an hour to get to that. You've been telling me this since the first narration. Yeah. I hate it. (laughs) I hate so much about this movie. But at the same time, there's a lot to really like. Uh, At the Sandlot, the gang starts another game. Benny hits the ball so hard that the casing falls off. And with no backup ball and nobody with 90 cents to buy a new one, Or 98 cents, I forget. Smalls runs home to grab Bill's prize ball, not knowing its importance. Because, you know, Benny spent all his money buying everybody amusement park tickets the night before. Yeah. Benny's great. And I guess the other kids were just going to sneak into the amusement park? Because I guess they came with no money as they didn't spend their own and had none for a baseball? They're all going to trade their chewing tobacco. How does nobody else notice the autograph on the ball? You'd think that they would have seen it the second he came with it. Yep. Like, oh, it's signed. Yep. And how is Smalls the one to knock it out of the lot and into the beast yard? Because that's the improvement he's been making. Zero to hero? Okay. Mm. And this is where he reveals the importance of the ball. Some lady gave it to Bill. Some lady named Baby Ruth. Or Bill's dad, sorry. Um, so earlier in the movie, mm-hmm. he gets made fun of for not knowing who Babe Ruth is. The great They Gambino. follow up with it, where in the scene when his mom comes in and tells him... Or no, not when his mom comes in, but we just see him writing on a notepad. Things to remember. Who is Babe Ruth? I guess he just never followed up that research. In the yeah. months that it's been. No, he has no idea. Until Ham tells him that Babe Ruth is the great Bambino. Oh, again. Puppet dog paw. Just stop. I get it. Kids movie, whatever. But it it, it just looks bad. <laughs> I do like how Benny describes Babe Ruth as less than a god, more than a man. Like Hercules. Smalls immediately gets sick. The boys come up with a plan to raise 98 cents to buy a new ball before Bill gets home. They try to replicate the autograph. And did they misspell Ruth? I didn't actually notice what they wrote, but I'm I'm amazed by their ability to raise the funds to buy a ball when earlier they didn't have the money for a new ball. Yep. Kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Mrs. Smalls tells her son that Bill's father gave him that ball and maybe someday Bill will give it to him. Not likely. They're not bonding at all. No, God, no. Smalls has the idea of just asking Mr. Myrtle for the ball back. Squint says that Myrtle's the meanest old man that ever lived. But rea- like we have no reason to believe that's the truth. Kids None are of stupid. them have encountered this man. <laughs> Kids are stupid. They all look out of the treehouse window into the beast's yard. And what the fuck is up with that doll, man? Why does it have an arrow through its eye? I don't, I don't know, man. Because I, I we meet Mr. Myrtle later, and he's a super cool dude. Yep. Who's murdering child's toys in the back with arrows? 
Oh God, maybe Mr. Myrtle isn't the coolest guy. <laughs> There's an alternate Sandlot too out there somewhere. What we didn't see is that that doll fell into the yard because some kid was practicing archery by putting it on the fence. Oh God, I hope that's the case. That's much more wholesome. I don't know what it is, but we have no reason to believe any of what we're seeing. No, we don't at all. Um, and the, the Babe Ruth baseball is already super fucked up. Yeah, I was I looking at try it, to get it back. multiple times in the movie, and I'm like, I couldn't give him this. <laughs> he, he's going to realize something is amiss. Like, why is it chewed and slobbered on? Uh, must have been like that when you left. It's a completely different color, too. Yeah. Uh, the boys make multiple attempts to retrieve it, uh, all to no avail. Absolutely hated this, like, Acme-sponsored segment yeah. of stupid and, plans. And again, that stupid dog puppet. Uh, one attempt, using three vacuum cleaners to suck up the ball, fails horribly. When the beast bites the vacuum pipe and the vacuums go haywire... Instead of just turning them off, everybody flees. Yep. Just turn them off instead of doing front flips out of the treehouse onto the ground. Like well, that's not funny for a kid's movie, you see. Broken bones everywhere. But yeah, I have a note right here saying, but we all know what kind of movie we're watching here, so we let it go. I, I do have to say, I didn't expect the treehouse to explode, though. Next I mean, get... the treehouse is still intact. It's just what's inside of it exploded. Okay. That should be a fire, then. Um, nah, it's just vacuum cleaners exploding their dust inside. There were flames. Nah, it's fine. Okay. The next attempt has Yaya come face-to-face -face with the beast. Why would you agree to this? <laughs> I don't know. I thought that, too. This is like... It's, this kid's it's, an idiot. It's suicide to climb over the fence. How about we lower you into it by harness? Slowly. Slowly. Yeah, that seems like it could work. Smalls uses his erector set to build a contraption in a last-ditch attempt to get Bill's baseball. And I love how he's like, all right, it's time to resort to science. Well, that failed just as miserably as everything else. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I, have. I, was like, I said right here. I'm not sure why they think this will work, since the Beast has already destroyed everything else they've sent in. Mm-hmm. And how does Myrtle not know any of this is going on in his backyard? My whole thing was, why don't they wait until he's sleeping? <laughs> like, there's even a part earlier in the movie where one of the kids says, oh, he just went to sleep. Okay, well, how about you wait until the evening and wait till he goes to sleep to try one of these stupid plans? Yeah, that too, but... I mean, if you want to go a little bit more realistic, this is 1962 America. Uh, any of these kids, if they wanted that ball back, they would go get their dad's rifle and kill that fucking dog. Oh, come on, man. They're not going to shoot a dog. They do it in a Disney movie. <laughs> Granted, it wasn't 1962 in that movie. But, I mean, if you're going to be realistic, uh, those were the times. That night, Benny has a dream where he meets the ghost of Babe Ruth, played by the wonderful Art LaFleur. I love how he looks nothing like all of the images and pictures we've seen of Babe Ruth in this movie so far. You're telling yeah. me you couldn't have just taken some black and white photos of Art LaFleur and said, hey, look, it's Babe Ruth. Yeah, that would have been the smartest move. It's like, who is this guy? <laughs> I was Babe so Ruth. happy to see him. Well, yeah, it's, it's Art LaFleur, so obviously it's great to see, but come the on, movie. Line. You're not even trying. One of his first lines pissed me off. I'm here because you're in some kind of a pickle, right? It's Drop the pickle, fucking pickle. Yeah. That pickle just... just keeps popping up all over the goddamn place. A baseball with my Jan, Jan, my John Hancock on it went over a fence and you can't get it back, right? Then just hop on over there and get it. I'm okay with that. I kind of like it. Uh, it's a mindset that I believe a lot of people really need. Uh, hesitation and fear of the unknown will definitely stunt you. So just go for it. I mean, I've fallen victim to that time and time again. I'm, I'm sure I still am. But when I'm aware enough to realize it, it always works out. Um, really good advice for kids within reason. But I totally disagree with the next bit of advice. Now who's overanalyzing this? 
<laughs> well, I'm allowed to. It's Art Lafleur, right? He's oh, an adult. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't believe everybody gets only one chance to do something great. Opportunity is everywhere. I believe, Sandro, the great Shia LaBeouf once said, just do it. I think everybody who watches this movie and listens to this podcast should follow that man's words. Then Babe Ruth steals Benny's autographed Hank Aaron baseball card. <laughs> what a jerk. <laughs> where, where did that even come from? He even says something like, I don't know why, but I want this. Like, why? Dude. Yeah, what are you going to do with it? You're a ghost. It's so stupid. The next morning, the gang head back to the sandlot. Benny breaks out the PF flyers and hops the fence to get the ball. And even now, I'm feeling like, like we said before, but now the movie is really dragging. Mm-hmm. We finally see the beast who spits out the ball. And what happens next is just insane and honestly feels like time filler. Also, sprinting toward a junkyard dog is a horrible idea. It's an undeniable show of aggression. Yeah, it's a game of chicken. Yeah. He gets the ball, jumps back over the fence, but the dog follows Chase, and this entire scene is grandiose. Eventually, after running through the entire neighborhood, they end up back in the sandlot. Benny jumps the fence into Myrtle's yard, and the beast follows, breaking the fence and causing it to collapse on top of it. Benny and Smalls help free the dog, who is immediately showing affection to its saviors. And the gang discovers a cache of all the baseballs that went over the fence during the years. We finally meet the real Mr. Myrtle, played by James Earl Jones. Phenomenal. And it's revealed that the beast's name is Hercules, which is a nice throwback. And I love, I absolutely love that Mr. Myrtle asks why they didn't just knock on his door and ask for the ball back. Yeah, and then all of the kids turn to uh, Squints and are like, come on! (laughs) It was great. One of my favorite scenes. Uh, Myrtle invites the boys into the house where it's revealed that he is also a major baseball fan. Just just two of them, though. The rest stand outside. Yeah, that is kind of weird. But as you, you believe that Benny is the lead, I think Smalls is the lead. Makes sense that they're both here. Mr. Myrtle gives Smalls a baseball signed not only by Babe Ruth, but the rest of the 1927 Yankees. And James Earl Jones in the scene is just so lovable. Yeah, such a terrible villainous person that wouldn't have given the ball back. But he's, yeah, right? Like, he's so kind. And then I think about the fact that he took a fastball to the head, which caused him to go blind. Is such an injustice to a feel-good movie. It's tragic, but it makes me like that character so much more. Uh, Bill and Smalls actually form a bond when he gets back, which is dumb as shit. Yeah, you lost my ball, but you gave me one that's signed by more people. I guess we're friends now. There was no other opportunity in this movie to make it seem like that could happen naturally, but okay. And we get a very strange voiceover explaining what happened to the gang over the years. Yeah, yeah, became one of the pioneers of bungee jumping. Oh, Party because they high. lowered him into the, the fence. Ha, 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 ha. The next one is haunting. Bertram got really into the 60s and no one ever saw him again. What? <laughs> yeah. That's why I think this is more of an adult perspective. Because this is either drugs or war for me. Timmy and Tommy became the uh, became an architect and a contractor, becoming millionaires when they invented mini malls. Squints married Wendy Peppercorn, had nine kids, and bought Vincent's drugstore. Ham became a pro wrestler known as the Great Hambino, which really made me laugh. I like that. Yeah. Kenny played AAA baseball, but never made it to the majors. He owns his own business and coaches a little league team. Hercules lived to be 199 years old in doggy years. And Benny ended up playing for the Dodgers. And now the movie closes with Smalls, a sports commentator, calling Benny stealing home to win a game. Fade to black and roll credits. So that's over. (sighs) You really didn't like this, did you? There's just some baffling decisions. Yeah. And why couldn't have Kenny... Well, first of all, he played AAA baseball and you just threw him away. Like, 
you just did not want to commit to this character at all for much of anything. That was my complaint earlier on. Kenny De Nunez could have been a really cool character, and he's a nobody in this movie. Should have said that he moved to Minnesota and his sons play hockey there. Oh my god, that would have been great. <laughs> Can you imagine a shared universe of the Sandlot and the Mighty Ducks? <laughs> like nobody would have questioned it or cared. It just would have been a, a fun little throwaway comment, right? <laughs> Got into business with some guy named Gordon Bombay. Well, that obviously would be way too heavy handed, but that'd be great. Uh, let's talk money. All do right. You think this, do you think this was expensive? No. Look at that puppet. There's no way it cost a lot of money. No, well, that $7 million went somewhere. <sighs> the soundtrack. That's my guess. <laughs> <laughs> the soundtrack One- and James Earl Jones. One million for the soundtrack, one million for Art Lafleur, five million for James Earl Jones. So what? Dennis Leary did it for Bazooka Joe Gum. Oh, he sucks anyway. Yeah, that and some like spent chewing tobacco. He's a good actor. He is a good actor though. Bill's a jerk. I don't know what Dennis Leary is like in real life. I guess Bill's not even that much of a jerk. He's just they did nothing with his character. He's selfish and preoccupied. That's but fine. They, they didn't even commit to it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. He is a great actor, though. You are right. Yeah. And he does some fantastic movies leading up to this and after this. Like, he had a great run just around this time. Yeah. I really enjoyed The Breath. I don't know if you've seen that. It's a good Christmas movie. Uh, I don't think I've seen that one, to be honest. But it's, like, right around this time that he does uh, um, Judgment Night. Was it that early in the 90s? Um, that was a fantastic film. Uh, it's it's not far off. Um, Great soundtrack, too. Yeah. What do you got there? 94? Uh, I'm trying to look, but they changed IMDb's website up. I don't like it. Okay, well, I'm looking up right now. So, yeah, he did uh, the Sandlot Judgment in 90- 1993. And that's the same year that he was a small role in Loaded Weapon. That's the same year he did Demolition Man and Judgment Night. All of them are listed as 1993. And And then the rest was the the year after. Yeah, 94. Along with Natural Born Killers. So, yeah. uh, Absolutely phenomenal period of time for him as an actor. Yeah. Um, How much did this movie make? 14. Yeah, attack another... 20 onto that seriously yeah 34.3 million okay that's good for them it's very good for them i can't believe though that they made two sequels to this after 2000 i like how we skipped over the ending where he talks about what the friends did and didn't mention what smalls was doing or benny at the end because we watched it happen yeah but no when you're when you were doing your recap of the movie you yeah stopped at that but you didn't mention benny was playing pro ball and smalls was the announcer yeah i have right here i read it aloud did benny you? ended up playing for the dodgers and the movie closes with smalls now a sports commentator calling benny stealing home to win a game oh nice yeah you completely missed that i must have i don't know where my brain went <laughs> i Jeez. don't know did you know who played benny in that scene uh, his father. No. Yeah. Older brother. Was it older brother? Yeah. No. Yes. Really? Yes. Huh. Cool. <sighs> Anyways. Why are you mad at me? I, I I guessed. You guessed and then questioned. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Just move on. Ratings. Uh, I'm going to say that this movie rated quite well. Actually. Yeah, it did. Uh, IMDb? Uh, IMDb, I'm going to say 8.3. 7.8. Okay, I went a little high. All right. Rotten Tomatoes, what did the critics say? Oh, critics? Pff, 92. 64. Wow, jeez. Yeah, I was surprised by that one, too. Uh, and the audience? All right, 92. 
89, very close. <laughs> uh, pretty much all around a well-loved movie. Yeah, I'm actually a little surprised that the Rotten Tomatoes critic score is that low. I figured they would love it. Yeah, I thought that would be the highest of all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's uh, let's hop into awards, and then we'll get into what we thought about the movie. All right, what was your least favorite character? Bill. Okay. Um, we were intentionally led to dislike him. That's not why he's my least favorite, though. My least favorite, or the reason why he's my least favorite, is that the character wasn't given anything to work with. That is true. As I've yeah. mentioned multiple times, they could have done an actual storyline with him. Exactly. And like opportunity was there, would not have taken that long, and it would have fleshed him out as a decent character. Right. But he's just a throwaway name. Well, how'd you get Dennis Leary for this? This could have been yeah. anybody. And Leary did a great job, but he just wasn't given much to work with. Nope. You? Uh, I actually went with uh, uh, Squints. Uh, the guy who tried to fake his death perv to guy? perv on a woman. The, the, mm -hmm. There's no way you can like this kid. Kids are stupid, man. Forever. <laughs> what about favorite character? I mean, I did want to give it to the puppet dog, but I, I thought that that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't fly. I get you. Right? Well, for obvious reasons. <laughs> It's terrible. Yeah. Favorite? Oh, Benny. Mike uh, Vital. And it's not based on performance so much as just... They make Benny out to be, like, the nicest guy ever. Yeah. Yeah. He is very likable. It's even, like, perfectly built into it that they could have played up a thing where he's just so obsessed with baseball that he treats people... Who are not interested in playing it 24-7. Like these guys want to do something else. And he kind of reprimands them for it. Like he could have gotten lost in that. And like no. They just make him the nicest character ever. Yeah. And that is why he is definitely not my favorite character. Okay. Because he is the most unrealistic character in this entire film. For me it's Smalls. What? Smalls is a doofus. Smalls is real. Real I see annoying. elements of his character in everybody I know. And yeah, that can be annoying at times. I have been Smalls before. You have been Smalls no, before. No, I guarantee no, it. No. Yeah, I know. Now you're no. just being ignorant. No. Everybody can see a part of themselves in the character of Smalls. And the fact is, he's not even the main character of his own story. Yes, he is the main character of this movie, but it's all about how much he idolizes Benny. But yeah, because Benny is awesome. Benny is not awesome. We've already called out the fact that this is an unreliable narrator. So this is just how Smalls sees Benny. We don't talk about that. I mean, whatever we want to say, he talks about Smalls or uh, about Benny. Benny still made the major league. So? You're telling me everybody who makes Major League Baseball teams is a fantastic person? No, but for, like, whatever the actual reason is, there's still a reason that he can look up to him. It's one of his friends okay. made it into the Major Leagues. That's fine. You can be happy for a friend's success. That doesn't make that friend, like, your favorite character. For you, maybe. But what I'm saying is, like, there is so much humanity in the character of Smalls. Um, the self-doubt. The self-deprecation. It's so human. And a lot of us get that. And this is a fucking kids movie, man. You're not really supposed to be thinking about this stuff, but it comes through the screen very easily. Um, and like, while he's not the best character, I will give you that. He is my favorite character. Nobody wants to root for him. He's a weenie. Oscar Nelson Meyer, Evan. even. Memorable lines. All right. What did you have for memorable lines? You know, I didn't have any until this morning. Really? Yeah. None of them stood out to me at all. And going off track for a sec here. Um, my cat, Jimmy, needs to take supplements for his hips because he's an old man and he has no tail. He's an American bobtail. He'll only take those with wet food. 
I give it to him at nine o'clock every morning. Now he wants it earlier and earlier. So early this morning, he jumps up on the bed and starts smacking me in the face. (laughs) And I push him away and put my head under the blankets and he digs underneath and starts licking my face. And when I tell him to stop, he smacks me in the eye. I roll over. (laughs) He jumps over on the other side and smacks me in the face again. I was like, God, you're killing me, Smalls. I'm like, holy shit, that stuck with me. So that was that's a gonna fabulous be, story. <laughs> it's going to have to be my memorable line from Ham. You're killing me, Smalls. Yeah, he says it a couple of times in the movie, too. Yeah, two or three. What yeah. about you, man? Uh, so what I wrote down is, you're killing me, Smalls. <laughs> it is a banger of a line, dude. I think the, the reason that I liked it particularly, I don't have any sort of story with a cat for it. Mm-hmm. Um, is just his delivery. There's something about the way Ham says it that it's just filled with so much exasperation. And I don't know, it's just, it stuck with me because it was just, it's short, it's snippy, and he delivers it fantastically. Yeah, if we were going for best performance, probably Patrick Renna as Ham. Uh, there's there's definitely some some holes in there, but I could see the argument. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, we we agree. Great line. I mean, there's definitely some parts of the movie where he knocks it out of the park. Well, there's at least one scene. <laughs> gotcha, motherfucker. I mean, that's what I was going for, Ben. I know. Jesus. Telegraphed it. Like Babe Ruth pointing. <sighs> Something wrong with you, man. Oh, there's a lot of shit wrong with me, dude. This movie's that's why we're spending over an hour talking about the fucking sandlot. Thanks, I know. It's bad. Yeah. Memorable scenes, Andrew. Uh, it's got to be the chase through town with Hercules. Yeah, I am uh, it's, with you. It's probably one of the most solid, consistent, um, entertaining scenes in the movie. Uh, there's some suspense action. It moves a lot quicker than like the 30 minutes leading up to it. Uh, yeah. And it's just one of those fun scenes where like, yeah, you get to see him interacting with things. Like all of a sudden it's not a puppet dog, which is great too, because they, you know, could, would not have yeah. shown that thing running around town. That dog um, is adorable. Yeah, it's just, it's a fun scene that is just really worth watching. Yeah. I agree. That is also my most memorable scene. It was a lot of fun. I could have done without the cake incident, but it's a kid's movie. Whatever. Well, and I think the 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 whole scene would have been a lot easier to swallow if the movie didn't drag so much before it. Cut out some of those needless scenes that we referenced when we were going through the movie and just make it a little bit better of a compact movie. When you get to mm-hmm. that scene, then you don't mind a few extra little shots just for the humor side of it. Yeah. But, man, they, they really drag to get there. Yeah, it just makes it really struggle struggle from a pacing standpoint. Okay, before you get too far into this, I'm going to start off by asking you then, um, having watched this now very recently, would you recommend it based off of your uh, your previous statements? Sure. The, the thing about it is, I don't know if I would necessarily recommend it to anyone outside of, say, kids uh, again. But my feelings towards it are pretty similar to, I guess, when I watched it as a kid. Like, there's nothing overly offensive about it, but it's not anything that I'd be rushing to watch again. To me, it was just it's a kid's movie that was a little bit more about coming of age than it was baseball. But, mm-hmm. yeah, like, it's just it's just okay. Right? Like, I don't know. Like, maybe that's yeah. even a shittier place for it to be is in this kind of middling like indifferent status, but yeah, I don't, it, it's, it's weird because I always was led to believe this movie was about baseball and it is not, it's about friendship. And as I'm, I'm cutting you off here. I apologize, but yeah, like what you're saying, like it's, it's a, a weird middle ground where it kind of presents itself to be one thing, but is kind of something else. It's inoffensive. Like, if you're just laying on the couch on a lazy Saturday morning and it's on TV, you're not going to be like, oh, man, I just wasted time watching that. But you're not going to be like, I need to go finish this. Like, it's whatever. It's there. So you wouldn't recommend it? I guess not. No. (laughs) 
like there is an audience for it. I definitely think that that audience will stick to a younger demographic. But even then, there's just so many other coming of age kids sports movies that I would recommend ahead of it. That yeah, it's it's, uh, it's unlikely. Interesting. Okay. Um, I I would recommend this, but only to people who haven't seen it yet. Um, I totally slept on this movie. Why would somebody who's already seen it need a recommendation? Well, I mean, I wouldn't tell somebody to watch again. They're like, oh yeah, I haven't seen it in a long time. Be like, oh, I, I recommend you check it out again. I do that with, you know, people who have only seen like a movie once when they're kids, like the Monster Squad. I'm like, yeah, I saw it when I was a kid. I'm like, fucking check it out again. It's really good. But yeah, it's a movie that I feel like everybody should see. And that's it. Like, it's not great. I thought I was going to hate it, but I, I honestly, I'm more so annoyed that I didn't watch this as a child. Cause I think had I, this would have been one of my favorite movies of all time, but there's no nostalgia factor for me. And it's just a, an okay kids film with some great messages and some great performances. But I, that, that ship has sailed. Like I, I really missed it on this one and I'm kind of pissed at myself. I love that Craig, recommended this movie and got the vote for it because I'm glad that I finally saw it. And yeah, like I said, I would recommend it, but trim it down guys. Like Shit. cut 20 minutes out of this movie and you're golden. Definitely can't agree with you there. I wish Craig's vote did not win or much rather done zero Valens pick of George of the jungle in this. Not me. I love me some Brendan Fraser. We know that. Well, who doesn't? The difference is I've seen George of the Jungle. Oh, the difference is I haven't seen it. <laughs> Count your blessings, sir. <laughs> but yeah, no, like I was very confused with my emotions after watching this movie because there's a lot to enjoy and a lot I didn't enjoy. Um, and I think it's because I watched it the first time as an adult. I was looking too much into it. If I were just a kid looking at it through kids' eyes, I think this would have been a blast. But yeah, I, again, like I said, recommend, but... I don't know. Part of it feels empty to me. Doesn't sound like a very solid recommendation then, but okay. Oh, it's a recommendation. Well, that was our thoughts on The Sandlot. If you guys want to share your thoughts with us, you can hit us up on social media. We are on Twitter at BS Bargain Bin, Facebook.com slash BS Bargain Bin. There's a very handy note section on YouTube. All right, Ben. Yes. What are we watching next week, man? Next week, we are talking 1989's Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Now, a motion picture so grand, so magnificent, and so vast, it spans 7,000 years. No way! Yes way! But it starts with Bill. I'm Bill S. Preston! Who is Joan of Arc? And Ted. Noah's wife? We are in danger of flunking most heinously tomorrow. A force from the future. Can we go anywhere we want at any time? You can do anything you want. Is putting history at their fingertips. Let's reach out and touch someone. They're traveling through time. How's it going, royal ugly dudes? Put them in the Iron Maiden. Excellent! Execute them. Bogus. How's it going, dude? And they're making a big impression. Historical. Babes. Now they're home. Buddy, get together. Remember who your buddy is. To trash the 20th century. We got a live one here. Keanu Reeves, Alex Winter, Napoleon. We're from history. Billy the Kid. Oh my God. Joan of Arc. Sigmund Freud. Tell me about your mother. You a musician? Beethoven. Genghis Khan. Abraham Lincoln. Party on, dudes! Socrates. George Carlin. We're history. If you guys are really us, what number are we thinking of? 69, dudes! <gasps> Bill and Ted's... Excellent! Excellent! Excellent adventure. Party on, dude. Until next week, have a good one.
All the best. 